Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Election-Inspired Incident Response Lessons from Real-World Scenarios. My name is Zoe Lindsay, and today we are going to take you through uh, a conversation about uh, some lessons that can be learned from real-world uh, election security practices and how they can be applicable to any business. I am joined today by my comrade in arms, Jamie Tomasello, CEO of Keel Paradox. Jamie, want to say hi? Hi, everyone. Hopping into our agenda here, and let me look off to the side because I can't read the tiny text in my speaker notes. Um, introduction, that's what we're doing right now, saying hello, uh, letting you know what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be going through election security best practices as well as lessons. So we're going to look at election specific security measures based on some references that we'll be taking a look at together. And then we're going to kind of shift into a more universal perspective and see what is applicable, what we can take out of these specific examples and apply within our own business, whether or not uh, elections are something that we're directly involved in. Then we're going to uh, go into uh, planning external event tabletop scenarios, what you want to consider uh, and what you can implement from the examples that we look through uh, throughout the rest of the session. And then we will recap everything for you. So this is the tell you what we're going to tell you part. That'll be the tell you what we told you part. Uh, and then we are going to hop into our questions. Introduction. We already did that. Uh, okay, so why is it useful to look at election security? Uh, in our audience today, most of our attendees do not have direct uh, election-based functions as a part of their day-to-day -day business. However, I think that um, elections are a really um, uh, well understood. Uh, it's a common touch point that most folks in the States have some perspective on, understand the importance of and the complexity of. But when we're taking a look at our security strategy and more specifically incident response and planning those scenarios to practice our incident response, there's some factors that pl at play in election security that I think are really helpful. And while not all of these are going to be applicable to every business, I imagine that some of this is likely applicable to your business. So uh, we are talking about uh, very well-defined operations. You're going to see there's plenty of references, resources, and very clear documentation on the expectations, the requirements, uh, and the contingencies involved in election security. Uh, I like that this is a global consideration. So uh, while this may be something that you may not directly be involved in, major world events impact every organization. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about uh, the ways that that can affect you in expected and unexpected ways. And finally, we're talking about a very complex process. There's a huge number of players uh, that are uh, working on these everywhere from career analysts all the way down to first time volunteers. Uh, we're dealing with a huge array of technology uh, from almost completely computerized systems all the way down to uh, hand counted paper ballots. Uh, and so this variance in, you know, the sort of optimal newest technology with the most traditional legacy technology can be useful for us when we are looking at the realities of our environment um, and the fact that we often can't uh, have the same solution in place everywhere. Uh, the main focus of today is going to be looking at how we can make our uh, tabletop scenarios a more functional and useful part of our review of our security strategy and our incident response playbooks. So we are going to be looking at free exercise considerations, the things that you want to make sure as you figure out and document beforehand, what to keep in mind as you're uh, doing these exercises to make sure that you're capturing the data that can make this a useful review down the road uh, once people's memories aren't immediately fresh on the matter. And then we're going to spend some time talking about post-exercise considerations. The tabletop exercise should not stop being relevant as soon as you've completed that review after the exercise is completed. And we're going to talk a little bit more about how you can use that uh, to reevaluate and reassess your needs. Before we hop in, let me just go ahead and launch here. Uh, we have a couple of poll questions and folks, uh, you should be able to see this menu. 
and you can add your answers. Um, I will run through our three questions here while everybody is taking a look. Uh, we're first asking if your organization has run a incident response tabletop exercise in the past. Uh, if this is something that you do on a regular or infrequent or ad hoc basis. Um, and then asking what the most notable outcome from a tabletop exercise review that you participated in was. That was a terribly grammatically phrased question, but hopefully you can follow my meaning there. Um, in the uh, research for this uh, webinar, I did find kind of an interesting stat that uh, the most common outcome in a widespread survey of uh, tabletop exercise effects that folks reported was increased budget for their security program. That's something that is helpful and relevant uh, to a lot of us, but I'm also curious to hear uh, what folks have to say there. I'll leave this poll open for a moment uh, so that you can go ahead and add your questions, or sorry, your uh, short answers. And then I'll go ahead and close that out here. So uh, we had, uh, everybody had done tabletop exercises at some point in the past. Uh, were they done on a regular cadence? Uh, we had about 20% saying quarterly. 20% saying annually, and the rest of the folks saying under no standard cadence. Uh, and then for our outcomes, I'm going to have to pull this up for us to look at afterwards because my survey is not showing me in the window that I can actually see. So we will go back to that or folks can uh, add it in the chat as well if they would like. Uh, I always like uh, to show our work uh, when we are talking about anything, we want to make sure that we are trying to use the uh, best, uh, most relevant primary source information that we can and that we're showing you the source of that information so that you know and can verify it for yourself. Uh, there's a number of uh, references that we looked at through the process of building out the election security uh, controls portion of this deck uh, that are outlined here. Probably the most heavily referenced is the uh, Essential Guide to Election Security uh, from the, I believe it's the uh, Election Infrastructure ISAC group. Uh, then we also took a look at CISA's Election Cybersecurity Toolkit. Uh, as well as the Election Assistance Commission's Election Security Preparedness Document. Uh, we are going to uh, cite examples across all of these as we go through today's session, uh, but you are going to notice that there are some commonalities uh, which are going to pretty closely align with some other frameworks that may be more familiar to you. We'll take a look at it in a second. Uh, but the very first step that we're going to be taking a look at, because there are so many controls uh, that are in play, you first want to start by assessing what your maturity level is. Uh, in the essential guide, there is very clear details on uh, how to establish your maturity levels as defined by those CIS controls. Um, and while this is written uh, primarily for governmental organizations, this can also be helpful for you in evaluating, you know, you may not have as sophisticated a security program or as extensive the resources as are defined for some of these controls that would apply to a much larger or a much uh, higher staffed organization. The important thing here to uh, take a look at is that we are uh, talking about uh, these de various frameworks that are written to specific compliance requirements or written to specific types of organizations, but have a lot of commonalities between them that are going to be applicable. And I'll go ahead and pass it over to Jamie here to talk us through a little bit about some of those other framework commonalities. Thanks, Zoe. So when we're talking about some of the other uh, common framework um, similarities and, and framework commonalities, we're really looking towards NIST and their cybersecurity framework, as well as their risk management frameworks. So in the, in the case of, you know, when we're thinking about 
um, incident response. Of course, incident response is going to be under detect, respond, and recover. But there's also an aspect of it that is about identifying and governing, right? And um, you can also see this, uh, how it relates in the risk management framework, uh, two resources that are really helpful if you know, you you are a small business or a small enterprise is looking at the NIST CSF 2.0 Small Business Quick Start Guide. Um, and as it relates to risk, looking at the Small Enterprise Quick Start Guide. We'll supply those links later as well. When we're thinking about risk, we're thinking about how are we framing risk? How are we assessing risk? How do we respond to risk? And how do we monitor that risk? And then as we are building out an incident uh, response exercise, we're looking at what have we identified as our assets? What are those What are those items that maybe we didn't identify as part of our risk management process? What's the most valuable and critically available services and resources? And really thinking about like how mature is our program and what tools and resources do we already have in place that we can leverage as part of our incident response exercise? Um, ultimately, when we're thinking about governing, we're thinking about, well, you know, how uh, gaining an understanding on how cybersecurity risks can disrupt can disrupt the achievement of your business mission. So in the frame of election and election security, understanding what those cybersecurity risks are that prevent a, a, a safe and secure election. Uh, we don't want to have our election undermined and we don't want to have our business mission undermined. So we start to think about like what what are those expectations, those obligation and our mission objectives? Who's ultimately responsible for those roles and decision making authority in our incident response playbook, but also throughout our organization and what needs to be documented or what has already been documented and needs to be updated? So those are the things that we think about when we're talking about incident response, we're thinking about frameworks, and this is this is what leads us into how do we tie that back to election security and ultimately project that forward into our own organizations. Absolutely. And I will just echo the value of those small business and small enterprise guides uh, for folks that are trying to figure out where to start. Um, if you've taken a look at the full risk management framework or cybersecurity uh, framework uh, on, on the NIST site, each of them is their own mini site uh, that has uh, a separate page for each section, sometimes for separate controls, and a ton of different resources and guides. Um, those small biz and small enterprise guides are great because I think uh, they're about six to 10 pages of infographics that really kind of boils down the essentials. Uh, also, while we are talking about uh, those controls, I just want to give a really quick shout out. Uh, we do have a free tool uh, Blue Mira has available on our site, the Domain Security Assessment. Uh, you can find out about it. It's bluemira.com slash DSA. You do not need to have a Blue Mira SIM or XDR account. Uh, it is available uh, just with uh, setting up uh, through your email address. Uh, and you'll get a quick rundown, an executive brief that gives you the highlights, um, and then an inventory of the publicly discoverable um, services and resources on your domain, uh, which is one of the topics that is enumerated in great detail in that election security guide and is helpful for just about anybody to uh, have a uh, handle an understanding on what is publicly facing, because it may not be the exact same list of your inventory of publicly facing assets, especially if it's been a while since you've done that review. So one of the things that we usually think about when we think about election security and other things that we've heard, whether it's in the news or uh, just as we think about our elections, is the importance of being indelible, the, the process of an audit. And for those of you that are familiar with your own security processes and things like SOC 2 or PCI, or even looking at things like ISO certifications, there is this aspect of that, that audits are important. Um, and the reason why audits are important seem pretty obvious for an election, right? You wanna verify that the results are accurate, but it's more than that. Audits are both quantitative and qualitative, both in elections and within your own organization. Yes, they verify that results are accurate or 
you know, that data is accurate within your organization, but it also validates consistent practices and transparency. And the reason why transparency is important is because it will instill public confidence in the process. So that's why it's important for elections, but it's also the same within your organization. When you have confidence within leadership, you have confidence within the board, investors have confidence in, 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 in the organization. You also have consumers that have confidence in your organization as well when you are transparent uh, with your audit results or that you at least go through audits. So those are important things to think about and the analogous uh, comparison between election security and cybersecurity within your organization. Uh, additionally, you'll note that there is a strong focus on clear role definition across the organization. Um, this is especially critical when you're talking about a live incident response. That is not the time that you want to be figuring out who is in the phone tree to call or who is responsible for a portion of your plan. Uh, it's also something that you want to take a holistic view of. I think that a lot of times when people are thinking about their tabletop exercises, they're focused on a specific threat, a specific attack as encompassed in that scenario, whether that is a new playbook that they are testing out, a new emerging threat that they want to figure out how to respond to. Uh, if you are focusing kind of purely in that direct response team, the IT and security team that are most likely going to be intervening to uh, respond and stop that threat, you're missing a good portion of the organization uh, that may have responsibilities in light of that event. Uh, we're talking about you may have legal considerations that you want to have members of your legal team. Uh, you have uh, PR considerations if this is something that is possibly publicly going to be disclosed. Uh, so you can see the visual aid here on the slide actually comes from uh, the cybersecurity tabletop exercise preparation guide uh, that is by, I believe, EI ISAC. Uh, we'll have a screen cap of that a little bit further down. Uh, but these are things to have clearly defined before you're preparing for your exercise. Your exercise is a chance to review these, to make sure that there are no gaps that are going to be uh, necessary in your playbook response that have not yet been defined. You want to make sure that you are confirming these rather than defining these as part of your tabletop exercise. This is a chance to test uh, and refine your plan, not create it. And in, in this particular example, when we're talking about our roles, you know, there are roles that folks don't commonly associate with incident response, or they don't necessarily have as part of their planning, like your customer success team. And it's really important to recognize that those contacts are important because before it even comes out to your comms team or PR, oftentimes your, uh, your customer success team or some of your um, customer facing sales team are going to be some of the folks that hear uh, some of the issues first. And so it's really important to make sure that they're looped in as well. So they're not giving out uh, inaccurate information or they're able, more importantly, to bring the information to the incident response team who uh, may be working this particular event. And in this case of a holistic exercise, they would be involved as well. You'll also see that there is a strong focus in the identify and preparation portion of this exercise. Uh, you want to be looking at the most critical uh, resources, assets, and services, uh, as well as those that are most at risk. And we're going to talk in just a moment about why uh, you may have some extra attention on that in regards to availability. Um, but in order to have a game plan as well as fallback contingency plans and uh, being able to prepare uh, an SLA for uh, these critical services to make sure that they remain available, you need to enumerate the technology and infrastructure necessary to keep them available um, and what those services themselves are. Uh, so this is coming from the no downtime in elections guide uh, from, the, uh, from CISA. 
And this is focused specifically on being resilient at, towards uh, DDoS or DOS attacks, denial of service or distributed denial of service. Uh, but this is kind of very specifically modeling around a threat scenario. So Jamie, tell us a little bit about why that may not be the whole of what we want to consider when we're looking at these types of uh, challenges. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a lot of folks, when they put together an, an incident response exercise, will really focus on, oh my gosh, what if this breach occurs? What if a very specific threat occurs? What about ransomware? What about, um, you know, we we have something that occurs that a really is 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 focused on a specific attack happening or the potential loss of information. And one of the things that, um, as you can see here following the election example is it's not only the denial of service, but it's the lack of availability. It really is thinking about how often is your availability impacted within your organization and what can be done from an operational improvement perspective to improve your availability, to improve um, any different aspect there. So, you know, it's really important if you're going to look at modeling from an election perspective, maybe designing more of an availability um, uh, exercise and thinking about, hey, when I have an availability situation, not just thinking, hey, what if my website goes down or, you know, what if there's a defacement, but thinking about, well, what if you operate in a region where there's a power outage? Um, you know, do you have a global um, service provider that may have key systems that you that you rely upon, potentially a single point of failure as part of your your processes within your organization or technology that may be in another country that would suffer from internet shutdowns during their elections. Um, I think one of the other things to keep in mind from an availability exercise perspective are natural disasters as well. And saying, okay, what if this was impacted? What if these pieces of key infrastructure are impacted, how would we still be able to maintain our availability, our uptime, our SLAs? And it may not be your hosting provider. It may not be your service provider. We're not talking about necessarily AWS East not being available. We're talking more about a situation where you may have a key vendor or a third party that um, provides a service that allows the rest of a particular process that you may be running to move forward. So we really want to be able to identify where those points of failure are and making sure that we're designing um, exercises that do focus on availability because it's not just an operational thing. It's an expectation for your customers and an expectation for other folks internally to be able to um, continue the business. Absolutely. And Jamie, you raise a great point that this availability is something that can affect just about any business or organization, regardless of uh, how close or distant they are uh, in relation to election processes themselves. Um, you may not have much likelihood of confidentiality or integrity breaches related to the election if you don't deal with any government contracts. But like that example that you just gave, availability can be affected by a multitude of factors and have some far reaching echo on effects. So we took a little dip into the pool of talking about some lessons and takeaways uh, already from these specific election security guides. We're gonna shift our focus now and talk a little bit more about how these lessons can be universalized and applied within your own organizations, whether or not you deal with government contracts or election security directly. Uh, so in your pre-incident prep, as we mentioned, you want to be reviewing uh, roles, both uh, those related to responding to the incident uh, as org functions, as well as the roles for conducting and recording the exercise itself, which we will delve a little bit more into uh, in just a few slides. You want to make sure that you are reviewing your communications plan. Um, that is external communications. Uh, that can be PR if there is potentially a public announcement that would need to be made after this incident were resolved. But also you want to have a, a good game plan around your internal communications, um, both communicating the effects of this after the incident is complete, 
but also making sure that you have a good way to keep your incident response team on the same page on regular update schedules as you go through. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as well. Uh, you want to define your key goals. Uh, and Jamie, I want you to uh, kind of highlight this again, because you mentioned it a few slides ago, but when we're talking about framing key goals, you know, we know the kind of the smart, you want to have them specific and measurable and relevant, um, but you framed it around the uh, organizational mission uh, and objectives. And I think that that's a really important point to stress. Yeah, I, you know, one of the things as you're designing your, your incident, it's one thing when you're doing an incident exercise, you're like, hey, let's come up with this really great threat or this very obscure, interesting thing that will help keep engineers engaged potentially in your exercise. But if it's so, if it's such an edge case that it doesn't actually um, happen that often, or if it is something that doesn't resonate with leadership, then it's a, a lot difficult, a lot more difficult to get executive buy-in to really have that holistic involvement throughout your organization, or you're, you will also lack executive buy-in when it comes to the after action report and getting any of these operational improvements addressed um, and implementing new security controls. So it's really important as you're thinking about the design of your incident, that you're aligning it with your goals of the company and any objectives that you may, that they're any business objectives that leaders may have. And that way it will resonate with them more and see why this is more important, more than just, hey, this is engineering or IT or security, having fun and doing something interesting. It actually has a direct impact to business outcomes. And I think that that's super important because there is a tendency in uh, IT and in security roles to oftentimes take almost a business agnostic uh, position because in some cases there will be a crossroads where you are making a decision between what is most effective for security strategy and what is most effective in cost, right? And in those situations, often we're trying to advocate for the more secure option, even if there is any additional business cost, because ultimately we know that it's going to reinforce the organizational reputation and help keep us safe but it can be really useful to know how to kind of speak business and tie that back to the goals across the organization um, so that you can be effective and get the tools, the resources, and the budget that you need to make those changes happen. Uh, Jamie, let's talk a little bit more about audits. We looked at the importance of an audit for an election, um, but how can we look at that kind of more broadly as a tool within our own organizations? Absolutely. So we were talking about some of those key takeaways around audits and election security around the quantitative and the qualitative and the importance of having that transparency and consistency, as well as validating or verifying the vote or the data and so when we think about audits in our individual organizations and in private industry, we're thinking about audits and not check boxes, right? We're thinking about the the concept of belts and respect belt and suspend belt and suspenders. We know that we want those audit trails to be important for detection and investigation. They help to identify our security incidents and support supports forensic analysis after events. We know that they help with accountability. They establish who did what when, and it makes users accountable for their action. And then we also think about it from a compliance perspective. Many regulations require organizations to maintain detailed audit logs and to, to be able to de demonstrate their security controls. And then lastly, we think about audit trails from a sense of recovery. How, you know, in case of an actual security incident, those audit trails help us understand what was effective, how to restore our systems. But when we go back to that uh, qualitative to the quantitative, uh, to, I'm sorry, from the quantitative to the qualitative, it also allows us to revisit our assumptions and the decisions that we made in the past. So we think about why the standard is in place. You know, is the standard met? And then is this standard met now? Was it met then? Why was this in place then? Why is it in place now? And as your organization grows, ultimately the belt that you may have had on three years ago may not fit, fit anymore. And so this audit is your suspenders because you may be at a different maturity level when decisions were made three years ago. 
And now security fashion may has may have changed and the controls or monitoring points that you had three years ago may be considered passe. So we really like to have the, the, the belt themselves of those controls, the, the things that we had in place. And the suspenders are our audits that allow us to not only check and validate the actual data, but also help us check and validate our, our assumptions and be able to evolve and grow from a, from a process perspective as well from a technology perspective. Absolutely. Uh, and then part of the value of these exercises is it is an opportunity for us to uh, take a snapshot and reconsider uh, what threats and what risks our organization faces. Uh, you are talking about, you know, when we're talking about uh Tabletop exercises, oftentimes we're talking about those direct threats, those targeted attacks. Um, but it's also important to think about opportunistic threats. What if a uh, vendor that you rely on is the victim of a phishing attack and your, members of your organization are in the contact, the address book, for one of those accounts that was breached? Well, that may now potentially pose a risk to your organization, not necessarily because you were being targeted, but simply because you were a convenient target as a result of another attack. Um, also, these don't have to be attacks or threats in order to pose a risk to the organization. Uh, that vendor issue that could happen if they were breached um, also, as we mentioned, could be a, a risk to your organization if they lose internet connectivity, uh, if they have a small team uh, and those team members uh, happen to all catch the same bug at the same time and now they're unavailable. So when you're mapping the landscape, you want to think about uh, both kind of those targeted threats, what assets do you have that may be attractive to an attacker, also potential risks, uh, what services are most critical and potentially at risk of interrupt interruption, uh, as well as your supply chain and third parties, uh, making sure that if they are affected that you have a fallback plan. Um, also consider having a multi-pronged kind of scenario, right? When we are looking at trends uh, across the industry, if you look at the most recent data breach report, one of the things that you'll find is that double extortion attacks are on the rise, right? So you'll have that ransomware attack, they'll encrypt uh, the information, they'll demand the ransom. And then once that ransom is paid, they're also going to say, well, now you have to pay us again to keep it quiet or else we're gonna release that. So in that situation, you're having a kind of a follow on attack. We'll often see uh, both a, a kind of a smoke screen attack where there's an initial noisy attack that is providing cover for a targeted quieter attack. A good example of this uh, is in Knox County from 2018, if we're looking at an election specific scenario uh, where Knox County's commission website uh, was DDoSed, it took them down and it uh, caused a scramble to get that site back online so that they could share election results. While they were focused on that attack, there was a simultaneous attack that was going after county uh, um, resident information. So an actual breach of county uh, member records, right? So you want to also consider when looking at your scenario, is this the extent of the uh, risk that we are taking a look at, or is this a element of that risk that we are trying to scope? One of the other things to consider when we're thinking about direct versus opportunistic threats is also our customer base. We may not, as an organization, be the attractive target. We may not be involved in government contracts. We may not be uh, involved in elections. We may not be involved in other, other things of that nature. But as we know, even as security companies, uh, we are often targeted because of our clients. And so it is really important to recognize that when you are running an organization um, or a company, that you may not be the target because you yourselves need to no longer be available. But it is also it is also about trying to get to your client, whether it is because of trying to get information about them or whether it is to disrupt your client's business. And so you end up being a target for that reason. The other thing to think about also is when we're thinking about external events like an election, we also need to think about different global events more generally and how it impacts the business. 
And a good example of this is anybody that outsources dev work um, with Ukrainian uh, devs. This is something that ha happened uh, recently over the past couple of years where folks were leveraging software developers who were Ukrainian and then were no longer able to be online or were not no longer available because of the war in Ukraine. Uh, and so sometimes we have to think about that as well, about when we are using outsourced um, outsourced teams, what it could look like when there are global events, when there are um, regions uh, in Africa and in the Middle East that um, do internet shutdowns for uh, during uh, exams, for example, not just political events, but student exams. And so we'll see a disruption or in other places, uh, potentially in Africa where there's not as stable of a power or an internet grid where there's that intermittent uh, challenge. So what does that look like to your organization, whether you're serving customers or infrastructure in that space, or you're, you're leveraging development teams in other regions of the world? Um, when we're thinking about post-exercise follow-up versus follow-through, one of the things that we have to think about with our exercise is, hey, it's great to say like, we all got a gold star. We did the exercise. We made our goals. Um, awesome. We did this. Let's check the box. We did our exercise for the year. It's a lot different when we were thinking about SOC 2. We're like, yeah, we did the exercise. Awesome. Let's move forward. Or when you actually have an incident, you follow up on it. But oftentimes where I've seen exercises fall down is when they forget to follow up on their after action items from the exercise, the things that they learned that they could implement to prevent that type of actual security issue from occurring, or maybe an improvement to uh, their operations. So make sure that you're following up on your findings in your after action report so that you're not having that same type of incident again um, in reality. You don't want to have to be able, you don't want to have to deal with that type of issue in the future. And so you have to really think about this as what am I doing holistically to shore up the organization and not just use this as a stress test or a drill. Yeah, they may they may uh, not pay too much attention post audit if uh, those uh, recommendations are implemented, but it'll certainly bite them if it if it comes back up during a live incident invest, uh, investigation after a live incident, right? Exactly. All right, so uh, we wanna make sure we have time for questions. So we'll go ahead and hop through to some considerations for planning your own external event scenarios. Uh, so first off, you're gonna wanna make sure to choose your focus. Uh, this is going to be an outcome after you take a look at that sort of assessment of most, service, uh, most critical services and resources, uh, as well as those that are mostly at risk that may be at risk of uh, threat compromise, that may be at risk of legacy technology that is less reliable than it used to be. Uh, so we wanna make sure that we are taking a holistic look uh, at defining that risk. Uh, awesome. You wanna make sure to frame that within the company mission and objectives, uh, not only to make sure that the recommendations get buy-in from your leadership, um, but also to make sure that when you are drafting in folks for this more holistic approach, uh, you are getting uh, you are getting their buy-in because they understand the importance to their role and to their job. Right. We want to think more. We don't want to just be thinking about what the top threats are. We want to be informed by any risk assessments, and we want to be testing out those top risks because those risks may not be specific technological threats. We want to make sure that we're testing points of failure that include the people, process, and technology. Uh, as mentioned, you want to look at your stakeholders. Now, that's going to be the stakeholders in your incident response playbook, as well as stakeholders in the exercise uh, itself. So, you know, when we're talking about those organizational functions and taking a holistic view, you're talking about your IT and security team, uh, but also you could be talking about legal. Uh, if you're dealing with uh, a issue that is arising with an employee internally, you may need to have human resources involved in that process. If it's something that may need public communication, that could require the involvement of public relations. If you're talking about a scenario that actually, especially when we're talking about an external event, we may be talking about a natural disaster, you may need uh, to have a member of the facilities team involved. 
Don't know why that was a tongue twister, but it was. Uh, so you do really want to think through uh, in every dimension of the scenario that we're describing, who may need to be involved here beyond that team that's directly responding to the immediate uh, threat or risk to the organization itself. And when you're doing your actual incident exercise itself, a lot of folks are familiar with the, the roles that you would have in any sort of incident, like your incident response manager or the person who's responsible for incident communications and your subject matter experts, and even having a note taker or a scribe that's going to be um, documenting the actual incident itself and updating timelines and other documentation. But when you're running an exercise, there's two additional roles that folks need to be mindful of. One is the exercise facilitator, essentially your dungeon master of the particular exercise. But the most important, the most important role that often gets neglected is the observer. This is someone who does not engage in the incident at all and doesn't actually, um, participate when there is a real live incident. This is somebody who's a part of the incident exercise process so that they're able to, to, to objectively um, grade in a way without any judgment and observe what behaviors were, were uh, called out, what behaviors were, were used, what documentation was referenced, how did the exercise run to be able to ensure that yes, my exercise did follow the way that we originally had it planned, or no, it didn't, and it went off in these directions. So the observer can actually give you some really good feedback on, was this even a valuable exercise for the organization, and did it meet the goals that are needed for the outcomes of the business? We also talked about the importance of reviewing your communications plan. Um, that is going to be your notifications about the incident that may need to happen externally uh, or uh, to the larger organization outside of those that are involved in response itself. But also you want to make sure that you have a very clear game plan in place uh, as well as a cadence for uh, communication for the response team itself. So you want to make sure that you've established a central operation space, uh, the, the war room as it were, um, and this can be an open channel that you have uh, your team members uh, joining as they are able, open in the sense that it is uh, a call that stays live for team members to join, not that you post the Zoom for anybody to join out there. Uh, you also want to make sure that you have some fallback comms in place. Uh, if you typically are using Teams or Slack or another messaging service within the organization have a game plan in place. If something were to happen, whether that's part of the scenario itself or just a complicating factor to make sure that all of these folks that absolutely need to stay in communication with each other can. In addition to having that open channel, you want to have a planned cadence for uh, updates to make sure that you are regularly syncing and making sure that information is communicated across the team as well as having a dedicated incident comms contact who's going to be responsible for making sure that critical information is shared between the teams in between those updates so that they have that person is making sure that nobody kind of falls through the cracks and assuming that another member of the team is going to let folks know. Having somebody dedicated to making sure that everyone's on the same page and critical information is shared out uh, quickly to all of those team members is going to be really crucial. And if, you, and if you've been running incident response for a while and have done exercises and you feel like you have all of these covered, then one of the other things that you can test as part of your communication plan is communicating out to those folks that you have on retainer, whether it is your forensic investigator, whether it's outside counsel, and making sure that you run your plan all the way down to that, to that stage, because oftentimes organizations may have their internal comms really solid, but then they have no idea who they're supposed to contact when they need to engage their forensic retainer. So uh, let's get to tell us what you told us uh, and take a look at a little recap so that we can get into our questions. Uh, so, you know, keep in mind, we're talking about how external world events, they can affect any organization, not just those that are directly involved in the event itself. Um, and really, we want to highlight the importance of considering holistic risks, not just threats uh, in response, uh, in your response playbooks. We also want to think about how effective incident response relies on having that well-defined and holistic organizational process with very clear roles. 
And we also want to make sure that our tabletop exercises have material impact on strategy and business outcomes moving forward, not just an annual checkbox in order to get buy-in for participation, as well as for remediation. Uh, I wanted to give a... Uh complete list of some of the references and resources that we used in this session. Um, I will provide this list to be sent uh, in the follow-up email that you'll get with the recording to today's session. Um, so those are the election security specific guides that I mentioned. There's also some incident response guides, uh, primarily from CISA uh, that I referenced uh, and had some uh, screen caps of in the slides here. Uh, that can be useful for you, even if you're not uh, part of or contracted with a government organization. Um, I add out also some Blue Mira uh, resources, that domain security assessment, as well as some details on how Blue Mira fits within the cybersecurity framework by NIST, uh, and some other guides and security tests that we have available. Uh, one quick mention before we hop through to our question section, if you are looking for ways to address those detect and respond functions within the security framework, Blumira can definitely help you out there. We're not going to dive into the full details of what our service does, uh, but we would be happy to show you. Um, you can find some information on our website, and if you have any questions, you can also reach out to me, zoe at blumira.com. With that... We still have 13 minutes for questions. This is great. Uh, so thank you, everybody. If you haven't had a chance yet, please add your questions in that questions box. Uh, as we give folks a moment to do that, we'll start with the first couple that we got. Uh, Jamie, this is a good one. Uh, so on that list of the incident functions, why is there a separate listing for the observer and for the scribe? If somebody's taking notes, can't they also be the person that's keeping an eye out and letting us know uh, what we should be aware of? They are two different roles because they serve two different purposes in incident response. So in an actual incident, your scribe is keeping track of the timeline, who who's... Um, who's actually made a decision, different things of like when things have been called out just so that people can um, keep track of where we are, where we've been. Oftentimes the scribe is making sure that things are getting written to the right Slack channels or if something came in through email, just making sure that everything is being updated in the, the appropriate documentation places. However, an observer is not the scribe because they're not thinking about what's going on in the actual incident itself. They're looking out during the exercise, not during an incident. They're looking to ensure that the exercise is running as planned. Oftentimes they have the scenario um, in advance so that they know how it's supposed to run. They are, they're able to validate um, whether the key points had been hit, the key objectives of the actual exercise, and essentially make sure that the person who is hosting the exercise or like that DM is actually making sure that they're following the, the exercise, that things didn't go missed um, from a procedural perspective on how we run an exercise and even looking at how the people respond, not just, hey, let's record what's happening in the actual incident itself. You're really making me want to run a Dungeons and Dragons campaign where the adventuring party finds out that they're going to have to bring an auditor with them on their next adventure to help them understand where they've fallen short and make, making sure that they're protecting the uh, villagers that they're saving. Hey, I think it's a great idea. I fully support it uh, as somebody who represents all auditor clerics. I like it. I love it. Um Okay, we've got, oh, this is a good question. Uh, we talked about a lot of resources, so I'm not surprised that we got this one. Uh, somebody said, I'm part of a small business. A lot of this still seems pretty overwhelming. Uh, so what are the best practices that I need to implement first? So Zoe, if you can pull up by chance. Um, yeah, I think I got it here. One of the things that's actually really helpful, we mentioned it a little bit, but the the CIS security maturity baselines. And so they have these different maturity baselines. There's prioritization of level one, level two, level three. And e under each of those maturity baselines, there are also um, the actual practices on how to get those implemented. So there's the priorities and the practices. 
And that's a good way to start. You can look at CIS. It's not only related to election infrastructure. You can go to the NIST um, Cybersecurity Framework for Small Businesses Guide. It's a good way to start. But one of the things to keep in mind as you're running through these baseline priorities, and so, for example, one of the first things that we have as a baseline priority is asset management or identify in NIST CSF. And I could tell you right now, not every single organization, even as a large organization who have strong security team, always have a good handle on asset management. So if you're unable to get a great handle on asset management, at least try, get good enough and move on to the next piece. If you need to focus on um your account management or your change management, move through those baseline priorities. You want to say, hey, you know what? I'm not going to be able to fully get asset management taken care of, but let me spend some time in user management and making sure we don't have password reuse. Let's make sure that we have MFA enabled everywhere that it's offered. And, and let's set some login thresholds. And that's somewhere that you can move quick, that you can move through. The other piece to think about is absolutely following the advice that's at the top of the page from CIS. Complete one simple task each week, implement one best practice each month, and then set aside a minimum amount of resources each quarter just to get yourself started. And then you're able to show results to leadership that will help justify for additional headcount or resources to move to that next level of maturity. There's a great adage that uh, successful complex systems evolved from simple systems and inefficient complex systems were conceived as a whole. And this is really applicable here, right? Where try rather than trying to, uh, you know, eat the whole elephant at once, you want to make sure that you're, you're doing these in sustainable and reasonable increments uh, and testing to make sure that they're working for you to move on to the next. Uh, also, we made mention of the cybersecurity framework and uh, risk management framework resources, these quick start guides. Uh, as I mentioned, this is the uh, cybersecurity framework small biz guide. It's nine pages. Uh, and one of those is links to additional resources. But it's a great kind of uh, 101, uh, you know, elevator pitch rundown of some of those considerations uh, that it specifically takes these controls and recommendations and considers them within the lens of your average, you know, growing business uh, in the in the U.S. And and it's something to also consider that if you know you're you're trying to figure out where to start. Let's say you you know you're you're just not sure have conversations with leadership about what they think risks are. Potentially, you may have the risk side of the house. You may have folks in finance or legal already articulating risks. And maybe there's an opportunity there by looking at those risks to the business and drawing connections to technical solutions, to people solutions, to process solutions. And that might be a good way to start because you want to find out what are those cybersecurity risks that can disrupt the achievement of your business's mission. Absolutely. I am not seeing any other questions come in. So with that, I wanna thank everybody for joining us today. Jamie, thank you for hopping on and lending your perspective and expertise. Uh, we hope that you will check out some of our other resources that are going up and keep an eye out for that email with the recording and additional resources mentioned on this webinar. Uh, Jamie, any last thoughts that you wanna leave our audience with today? Yeah, the, the one thing that I would like to leave folks with is, you know, good enough is okay. It's okay as, a, as an organization to, you know, not strive for perfection. Do not let perfection be the enemy of good in, in designing your incident response exercise in your incident response plan and even in actually following through with your incident. We it is very important that you just get started to ensure the integrity of your systems. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. We will see you on another Blue Mirror webinar very soon. Stay safe, stay well, and have a great day.